we always like to recognize our funders. We are part of the Office of the Secretary of State here at the Washington State Library. And our grant funding is as a result of um, funding from the uh, Institute of Museum and Library Services. That's how we're able to bring you these programs. My name is Carolyn Peterson, and I will be your facilitator today. And I believe Sumner and Daniel, if you have a question, please type it in the chat, and I will draw Sumner's and uh, Daniel's attention to it as we go along. So we'll do that. And technical support, the gentleman you've been hearing is Jeremy Strout. And if you might want to contact, uh, copy down either his email, as he's put it down there in chat as well, if you need, have anything go wrong. Um, or you all of a sudden couldn't, can't hear anymore. I will say that we occasionally have um, uh, broadband issues. And that's when you'll hear our voices uh, speed way up and become really tinny and fast. And that's just sometimes getting our um, packets through the, um, anyway, the packets through. So that just happens occasionally. And it usually evens out. So again, I want to admit that we, um, that the Secretary of State, who is our uh, parent agency, and the Institute of Muse Museum and Library Services, who funds us. And now, today, we are going to ask that you please type in your name and your library organization. And sometimes people do um, you know, have a, a speaker set up, and there are several people. So if you would just type in uh, your name and the library or organization that you, a library organization that you are um, associated with. And thank you. So City and State would be great as well. And we'll give everyone a moment to do that. And once we see everyone has stopped typing, we will go, I will, um, we'll get started with our our organizations. OK, I think that is primarily done now. So now I'd like to introduce our two um, presenters today. Sumner Hayes is currently a teen services librarian at the Seattle Public Library Central Branch. Previous to that, she worked um, both as a teen services librarian and a public services librarian with a focus on serving immigrant and refugee populations. Um, her current projects include providing arts and employment programming at agencies serving homeless and unstably housed youth. Daniel Duval is, has been with King County um, for the same amount of time as Sumner was there. They both started in 2004. Currently, Danielle serves as the public service specialist for mobile services. Diane, Danielle excuse me, has created, developed, and taught computer and job searching skills programs for refugee centers, homeless shelters, and safe houses. She works with retirement communities and senior centers to provide classes for older adults. She's also involved with youth programs, free lunch programs, community centers, and office, offers um, computer training on the STEM subjects to King County youth. Currently, she is leading the IDEA project for KCS, KCLS, King County Library System, which implements outreach services in 3D printing, robotics, electronics, digital media, and game and coding design for King County. So for no for, with no further delay, I'm going to turn the um, program over to Danielle and Sumner. And thank you very much for being willing to share your expertise with us. Thanks, Carolyn. Uh, this was Summer. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, we are going to be sharing some information. Hopefully, that will be helpful to you. Um, Danielle and I worked together real closely for a few years, um, and then um, separately have done a lot of work in just serving different kinds of organ or different kinds of patrons um, that are traditionally underserved. So, can everybody hear me? Okay, I'll take that as a yes. Everyone is typing in yes, so it's excellent. Good. <coughs> okay, so the big question this morning is how can libraries best reach populations who have barriers to access? And I think that we see um, patrons with different kinds of barriers. You know, we have language, we have transportation barriers, we have just a general um, lack of understanding with some patrons about how to use the library and what um, the library can provide for them. 
So Danielle and I are pretty um, fortunate to have worked for library systems that are um, very forward thinking in how we are able to provide services outside of the actual buildings. Um, currently, um, I've only been at Seattle Public Library for about seven months, so I'm still trying to um, figure out how the structures are, are in place for us to get out of the library. Um, but recently, Seattle Public Library adopted um, new service priorities um, and are, is moving towards a really robust outreach services plan through collaboration and partnerships. Um, so right now, I'm able to focus on three different um, service priorities, which are youth and family learning, um, technology and access, and then community engagement. And this is Danielle Duval here, and um, I have the great opportunity of working for King County Library Systems, which really is um, leading uh, all over the country in their outreach service strategies. And the, two years ago, they adopted something called the Future Staffing Plan, um, and it is now current staffing. And what that does is allows librarians to do a um, a community uh, research to decide which areas that they need to be targeting and bringing services to. So it's a big priority to take uh, programs outside the library into specific communities. And uh, with that, we've been able to develop some really unique programming and have gotten some best practices. One of the parts uh, of the program that Daniel, yeah. can you? We really are having a hard time hearing you. Can you adjust your mic so that it's even with your chin? Yeah, is that yeah, better? Sure. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, now we can hear you. I, I, I felt I had to interrupt you so we could hear what you had to say. Perfect, yes. that's great. Um, so one of the parts uh, that we found that was really successful is I'm primarily outreach based and one of the reasons that this programming opportunity worked so well is Summer was based out of uh, a branch at the time and by partnering with in inside branch staff and the outreach staff, we were able to capitalize on some unique opportunities. And through that, both Summer and I have learned some really great things and been able to take those skills that we learned and, and make these programs better. So hopefully you'll get a chance to see that through our presentation. All right, so we do um, have a few questions. We're really interested to see how many people um, are already doing outreach and have established partnerships. Um, so if we could get a quick yes if you've been doing we, that already. We are getting a little bit of feedback now. So um, if whomever isn't speaking at each time, drop the mic. All right. Better? Yes. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, if any of you are currently doing outreach services, um, if you could give us a quick yes, just so we have a sense. Is that two? Just a reminder for folks, the uh, polling is right here. Check the yes or no. OK, so, oh, there we go. And then how many of you are interested in forming more um, robust partnerships with external organizations to push that outreach even further, um, but aren't really sure how to get going on that? All right, so a few more. And then um, for all of you, is the library system in which you're currently working, does it have a support system for you to get out of the building and form those relationships? OK, great. So it looks like a few of you um, don't feel like you have that much support, but most of you um, Looks like you have some avenues to get that work started. OK, so um, when I was at KCLS, we started um, a community discovery project. And that happened at every branch throughout the entire system. 
and we used a lot of different strategies to figure out what exactly was happening in the communities in which we were working. Um, <clears throat> so we did, obviously, the basic census and other demographic um, data research that any library would do to figure out who's actually living in their communities. Um, but then we also had this um, really great tool called Community Connect, and that was sort of an uh, aggregator tool that would pull information from um, census data, but then also a lot of really detailed marketing data, um, and then overlap that with the information that we had about library patrons and we were able to get very, very detailed reports on, um, you know, how many people in a certain block radius had library cards, and it, it was very sophisticated and really, really helpful, and that was able, that we use that tool a lot to figure out um, where we might want to focus some of our energies. Um, <clears throat> but then what was especially useful was for us to actually get out and um, really start talking to people in the communities. Um, we did interviews with um, staff at basically every social service agency we could get into. Um, sometimes we just drove around or walked around the communities um, and then really worked with the existing connections that we had with different schools um, and already established relationships to see if we could get a better sense of where the service gaps might be um, and how we might be able to partner together and, and address those gaps. So when we started this um, community discovery project, and I, I think most people who try to get out into their community, you know, feel like they already have a pretty good understanding of what's going on, um, but, you know, then we, obviously we found a lot of surprises. Um, we, th these are just a couple of graphics that I pulled um, from different sources. Um, the one on the left is just a list of the major languages that are spoken in King County. Um, in Tequila, where Danielle and I were working together, there were about I think 68 languages that were spoken in the Tecola School District there and in the Highline School District too, so um, quite an international community. Um, the middle slide is um, a breakdown of demographic data, which was actually really disturbing when you look at King County. I mean, we've got in the south end of the county just due to um, pretty persistent poverty and um, and other issues, I mean, life expectancy is 13 years less in the lower part of the county than it is in the north and in the east. Um, you know, much higher obesity rates, um, much higher number of uh, families living in poverty, um, and then a significantly higher um, unemployment percentage. So, you know, just by looking at this map, you can see how many opportunities there are to get out into the community and do some work. Um, and then the slide on the right is the results from the latest 1-9 count in Seattle. If you're not familiar with, or in King County um, and Seattle, and if you're not familiar with that, basically people go out and they count the number of people who are out on the streets to see if we can get just kind of a snapshot of the homeless populations. And if you look at the slide, you can see that it's just steadily going up and up and up and up over the past five years. So that right there gives us um, a pretty good indicator of where we might need to direct our services. <coughs> and then I'm going to turn this over to, oh, sorry, we're on two different sites. We've got three computers going on our end, so. Um, so, um, for identifying local partners, um, one thing that we might need, um, one thing that you're going to want to do is um, use all that community development or community research that you've done um, and really sit down and take a look at your um, assumptions about what the community needs versus what those needs actually are. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about this later, but um, Taking a look at the traditional classes and programs that you might be off um, that you might have offered, um, and then how you can use the data that you've gathered um, to create a more reactive suite of services. Um, 
assessing location requirements, um, limitations and opportunities is something that you're really going to have to pay attention to with local partners. Some people are going to be off able to offer things um, that you can't, and some people or some agencies just may not have the facility requirements that you need to do certain programs. Um, communication and collaboration between agency staff and the library is key, obviously. Um, I think one of the reasons that the partnership that Dan uh, Danielle and I had with an agency called Refugee Women's Alliance was so successful is that we all three um, would get together and meet and every quarter would um, hash out a strategy for how we were going to um, teach and what subjects we wanted to cover for that quarter. Um, the internal collaboration for external partnerships was really key. Again, Danielle and I were always communicating with, you know, what happened to class this week? How can I um, pick up from where you left off and continue that subject of study um, or that class curriculum? and um, just making sure that everybody was on the same page. Um, and then um, one thing that is always really nice to keep in mind, too, is that when you are doing partnerships and outreach, you want to make sure that you're connecting different agencies um, that might not already be talking so that they can figure out how to also best serve theirs. Um, I just want to jump in here and add a quick point. When you're talking to and interviewing the community partner, it's really important to get their feedback. But one of the things that we found was a also important was to get the students' feedback. And we would, we would talk with the organizations and they would say things like, we really want email. We really want um, you guys to give email that would be very helpful to our our group. And once we got the students involved, we realized that, you know, the teachers assumed that they wanted email, but we really had to start somewhere else because the, they, weren't even, they weren't even ready for mousing and typing skills. So it's important to keep that communication going between the students and the teachers and set realistic goals that actually match the community that you're tar targeting. Um, and, and that just is something that you have to keep reassessing all the time as you, as you go along. Okay, so this next slide, um, creating a multi-pronged approach. Um, another way to think about this is a kind of wraparound services um, where you are creating um, several levels of service. Um, and I think, you know, if we think about traditional outreach, outreach methods where, you know, like back in the beginning of my library career, like I would bring a, pro bring a program to a community center and, you know, just sort of offer it there, and that was the, the real end of the partnership. Um, but with a true partnership um, and able to create this multi-layered approach, um, both the library and the partner organization are really collaborating to provide holistic services, and I think this is where the patrons are really benefiting. Um, so, you know, again, in that traditional model, you might just bring a program out into the community somewhere, um, but with this multi-pronged approach, what we try to do is always loop it back to the library. Um, so when we did the partnership with Refugee Women's Alliance, um, one of the sort of uh, specific projects that I worked on was this intensive ESL class. And they had gotten a grant for the six-month project um, to um, do six hours of teaching with a small group of students every day. And part of the grant was that they had some very, very strict deliverables. Like the students had to um, prove that they could fill out a form. They had to know how to make an online appointment um, using a computer themselves. Um, and what I did is that I worked with the ESL student or the ESL teacher who was in charge of that grant class. And we looked at every piece of the curriculum and figured out how we could use the library to meet those deliverables. So with the filling out of the form, you know, we would have the students come in and fill out a library card application. Um, for the online appointment piece, we had everybody come in and learn how to use the computer reservation um, software. So, um, you know, so all of that, even though their, the main goal was to get them through the, you know, the, the grant class and, and have those deliverables, what we were doing at the same time was teaching them very basic library usage skills that they might not have done otherwise.
So um, when developing appropriate curriculum, it's really important to, like I, I mentioned earlier, be working with the organization to find out what's, what's really important. And in this multi-prong approach that we were, that Summer was mentioning, we try to really hit on multiple skills at one time. So not only is it important to align the curricula with the library agency goals, but it's also um, a good idea to create programming that tackles a few different skills at one time. It's a, um, you need to identify those gaps. So many of the students have high-level English skills, but low-level computer skills, and sometimes that's the reverse. When looking at other communities as well, um, we might find someone that can type, but they, they have no skills on the internet. So you need to really work with your students. Oftentimes when I start a class, I have an interview process at the beginning. So it, I will say, introduce yourself. But I also ask them to identify where they're at in their computer session. Because typically in the library environment, we're getting eight to 10 people from all different places. So it's really hard to have a class um, when everybody's coming from such a diverse er uh, skill set. And we also really wanted to work on skill building versus skill application. So what that really means is yeah, it's a great to have a word class, but in the word class what we would do is we would work on typing and we would work on our mousing skills at the same time. So at the end of the day, it's not that they're um, finishing this amazing word curriculum. They're getting practice typing, they're using the mouse, they're understanding tabbed interfaces, and then that can be applied in a different area. It was being applied, the word uh, class was being applied in emailing, and it was also being applied in internet skills as well. And so sometimes your facilities have computer labs, sometimes they don't. So you really need to be talking to everyone and seeing what the facility needs with regards to um, laptops, with regards to iPads, and then also with um, what they need. And again, I, I mentioned the scenario where the teachers are talking about we really want email. And that's a very high level class for this type of environment. And we also want to make sure it's relevant to library goals. Um, we want to make sure that the students can find their way back to the library and understand that if they need help continue in education, that they can go to the library to look for a resource. Um, and finally, just evaluating and reassessing on an ongoing basis. And that's really important. Some of our students started really, really low level. And one of them I can think of was a, a, a boy named Elias. And he came in, and he had only been in the country a short time. And within three months, he was working through more advanced curriculum than most of my students had ever gotten to. But had I just tracked him in the current state, he would have got nothing out of the class. So by checking back in with the students on a regular basis, assessing their skills, and assessing that the curriculum that we were bringing, we were able to get him moving forward. So uh, this is a quick thing about uh, program evaluation and our numbers, which are great. I'm going to let Summer talk a little more about this. OK, well, I think we tend to get really caught up with numbers, and especially, um, you know, you come back and you do from your program, and you need to do your statistical reports. And I think numbers can be really, really great. Um, the quantitative data is great information, right? I mean, it gives you a snapshot of services. It lets you know how many people you reached, how many people you taught. Um, and so this is just the time that Danielle and I worked together at KCLS um, between her tech lab visits um, to Refugee Women's Alliance and my visits both on site and having the classes come to the library. Um, we did a total of 242 classes. And um, the number of patrons in those classes was almost 2,700. So that's a lot of numbers. That's really, really great. Um, but I think that that doesn't really get to what's really happening here. <clears throat> and so we spend a lot of time talking about numbers versus impact. Um, and you know, I think we all just want to know that the work that we're doing is valid and important and is actually having an impact on people. Um, this is a card, a thank you card, that I got from a student named Debbie. And I worked with Debbie for I think the entire time that I was in this job, she was enrolled in ESL classes at Refugee Women's Alliance for over two years. Um, very, very sweet. The 
you know, the first time I met her, she had, I think, like one or two words of English. I mean, she really had absolutely no English. Um, and by the time I left, she was emailing assignments to her teacher. Um, and so, you know, I think this really, this really shows the importance of when you are doing your program evaluation, making sure that um, you are focusing on this idea of the outcomes-based evaluation, which really is, um, <clears throat> um, which really is just getting to the idea of does your program um, do what you want it to do? Is it having an impact? Um, and figuring out ways to show that. Um, you know, again, the numbers only shows you so much. And I think if you can develop some program evalu evaluation tools, um, you know, it could be a simple survey. It could be an event report that you write up every time you go and do a class or a program. Um, or just doing some um, on-site interviews with the people that you're, you're reaching, um, you know, get some good quotes. I think we're, you know, especially with a lot of funding coming from different foundations and um, various sources, people want to know that um, their money is being spent well and they want to know that um, the programs that they are supporting are actually having an impact. And when you can tie these personal stories and that makes a huge, huge so difference. So before we move off of this slide, I want to just talk a little bit about CASER and this example of what type of programming we were doing and what and bring it home that idea of multi-pronged approach. So this particular assignment that you see was a word-based class, but we worked with the teachers and the students were able to write up their own bio and they had some questions and they were able to respond and then we showed them how to insert a picture and so each of them got to print and take home their story. The printing and taking home their story was the so awesome. They just loved having this takeaway. But what was more exciting about working with this specific student, Kaser, is one day he filled out a job application online and we had ha happened to invite one of the directors of library services to this day and the director worked with him to, um, to fill out this online application. And what ended up happening was within a week, Kaser got a response and he got a job and we were able to send that up to um, the, I was able to report that back to the director that when he helped this particular student, there was a job that was achieved at the end of that class. And that was a really great way, not only for us to just have impact, I think that Summer and I could tell you about impact all day long, but it was a way to bring it back to KCLS as a whole and to quantify why we do this and why it's important to have things going. And as simple as this little word assignment is, it really helped him fill out the online application in the end. Another interesting component about um, having our, such great impact is one day I was working with a, a group in um, Crossroads and I had gone and uh, done a, a talk time with them and invited them back to um, what our talk time at the library and it was great. This was with a refugee committee and I had spent some time with them and said to this group, there's probably 25 or 30 of them, you guys should come to our talk time. It's so exciting and it'll be fun. And what I didn't realize was that this community wants to be engaged and so they went to the talk time and uh, why this is bad is because I didn't tell the local branch staff that I had invited 30 people to their talk time. <laughs> and so uh, the next thing we know, the talk time volunteer was um, sending us emails with that they were none too pleased to have an influx of 30 students at their program. So it's really important that you're communicating back to your branches and bracing for impact because this is an area where we were able to go and we were able to work and talk with these students and they did come and they came in big numbers numbers and we needed to be ready for that. So uh, again, we talked about this idea that the, the teachers were wanting us to do email and we really had to go um, and look at this in a different point of view. 
which was uh, adjusting our curriculum to where the, the people were at. Um, and both Summer and I experienced this in different ways. I mean, I spent probably the first three three months just going over mousing skills and click, 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 and, and communicating click to non-English speaking students is more um, difficult than you realize, especially if that's not your first language. So we had to just adjust our expectation and, and, and the curriculum accordingly. Oh, we lost your audio there. Sounds like your mic was moved away. It, okay. Um, I had exactly the same experience that Danielle did. Like, I showed up at Refugee Women's Alliance, and I was all ready to teach my citizenship classes, and um, got there and had a class of senior citizens who spoke absolutely no English and um, had to adjust totally on the fly, um, you know, not understanding that most of them had never touched a, com a computer before. A lot of these people had been living in um, refugee centers for some of them uh, up to decades. And so, uh, you know, again, it was just a, a very potent reminder to um, check your assumptions at the door um, and really spend some time up front talking to students, talking to staff, and figuring out exactly what people need um, instead of just showing up with a whole bunch of things that you think that they're going to want to know. Um, and yeah, like Danielle said, and we spent months on super, super, super basic computing, computing skills. Um, and what we found was that we could, you know, again, going back to the idea of the multi-pronged approach, um, we found some computer programs that were available free online that um, required very basic mousing skills, very um, basic English skills, and we would put some of these students in front of the computer and they would just go for hours. Like, they did not want to stop, but what they were doing is they were building the literacy, the computer literacy, and the English skills simultaneously. And that turned out to be um, extremely successful in having these students move forward to the next level. I'm just going to say, what that really taught us was that we had to come with multiple activities prepared instead of just one, because the room was going to be so different and the students were going to be so different. So uh, Summer and I started developing something that we call our toolkit, which we're going to talk a little bit more about, but we had to be uh, comfortable quickly changing curriculum between students, and so we had to really um, start creating this uh, idea of how we were going to quickly in, keep students engaged but quickly change um, the curriculum for each individual student. And I think you'll see that we did and created kind of a little a robust system. Here are some of the activities that we started to work on. Um, one of these, uh, the one on the left is just by working with the ESL teachers and getting what they're working on in class. In this situation, they were working on the cat is on the table. And so I said, okay, let's take those literacy skills that they're learning and combine them with typing skills. So we would create writing prompts that they would have to practice typing. And it's um, and the students would sit in there and type, the cat is on the table, and learn what a period is. Space and period are concepts that are not easily understood or taught. And that is one of the things that we had to really work through when doing these simple word classes. You'll see that we have this uh, website called starfall.com. And this really worked through basic literacy. This was great for our low-level students. They were able to click and move and navigate through the site easily while learning uh, literacy skills. So a apple, they had to click apple. They had to sort um, capitalized, capitalized letters and lowercase letters and do activities like that. There's some basic reading activities in here as well. So this was a place that we could direct a student that maybe couldn't type yet and still needed some literacy help. Again, we talk a little bit more about the My Story. The reason that this is important, and I, I'm showing you this again, is because the uh, slide, the worksheet on the left and the worksheet on the right are two very different um, 
students and they were in the exact same class. Ali on the right took this assignment and he loved it. You can see that most everything is capitalized and periods are there. He also started to edit his own full um, photo. And the one on the left, she just got through the typing. Sometimes she remembered spaces. Most often she didn't have punctuation. And um, she didn't do any of the formatting. And this is a win on both accounts. And, and that's one of the re beauties of this is um, Adoba got to work in Word and still get skills while Ali got a chance to learn the other options in Word to make him more proficient. And so that was really, really great. I'm going to, okay. Um, so this is a um, selection of some of the tools that I used in the library. Um, one of the nice things that um, worked really well with the partnership that we have with Refugee Women's Alliance so that it was about a half a mile away from the library. So Danielle and I both went there separately. Sometimes we went together um, and we taught a gazillion classes there, but then also the classes came to the library on a pretty regular basis. Um, and so these are some of the activities that we did. Um, library scavenger hunt, pretty standard um, for lots of different audiences, um, but I just chose things that were going to be really relevant to this particular group of students. Um, and then the library worksheet, this actually came from one of the ESL instructors, and what we did is um, we took the, you know, kind of welcome to your library pamphlet. Um, had the students break out into small groups and they had to work through this entire worksheet. Um, I will tell you that this took a really, really, really long time. Um, I think they probably worked on this for between 60 and 90 minutes just to complete these two pages. But the, at the end, it, you know, we all went through the worksheet together um, and the students really understood how to use the library, what the library could provide, and what was appropriate um, rules of conduct. So, um, you know, really basic concepts, but for people who are coming from areas where public libraries simply don't exist, um, we found that spending a little bit of time on this up front really changed the perception of the library with these students. So we're going to shift a little bit um, from talking about refugee and immigrant population, um, you know, which is an area that I really focused on when I was at King County. And then now that I've moved to Seattle Public Library, I work in the Central Library downtown. Um, and I'm continuing the same kinds of outreach and the same kinds of partnerships, but my audience has completely changed. Um, so instead of going from, you know, predominantly older, refugees. Um, I'm now working um, most closely with agencies that serve homeless and unstably housed youth and young adults. Um, <clears throat> but the concept remains the same. You know, I've gone out, I've done my um, interviews with my social service agencies. Um, the past six or seven months has been predominantly relationship building. Um, so I've had a lot of meetings with staff at different agencies. Um, we've been visiting the drop-ins that exist at all the agencies. Um, so we just show up sometimes and give out free stuff. Um, I think the biggest thing is just to get yourself out there and get people really familiar with you and who you are and what you do. Um, Especially with this population, um, we have a real focus on reducing barriers to library use. So what we try to do is bring somebody from our borrower services department. Um, they come with a computer and they're able to work with youth to, um, in many cases, reduce the fines or remove lost items from cards. We found that a lot of these kids have come from um, foster situations where um, an adult has used their library card to check out um, many, many, many items and never return them. And so they are left with these giant fines on their cards that, you know, had happened when they were children. So, um, so we do a lot to, to clear out as much of that as we can so that they can use their cards. Um, we have really, at the beginning, focused on providing more art space and recreational programs, um, but then now we're moving towards um, doing programs that are a little bit more um, focused on employment. 
So there's an organization that I go to twice a month and just um, do employment classes for the youth that are there at that time. And then these are a couple of things that I have um, used. The one on the left is a resume worksheet that's available to anybody. It's just on our, the Seattle Public Library website under our job, job page. Um, and so I bring this a lot whenever I do an employment class. It's, it's just a really great handout and gets people thinking about how to do a resume. But the one on the right um, is, actually I can't take credit for this. I think it came from Sacramento Public Library. Um, and it is a youth focused, um, Dewey Decimal Cheat Sheet, basically. Um, but what it is, is it's pulled out um, topics that are of interest to youth. Um, and I think especially for a lot of homeless and unstably housed youth, um, they can be resistant to asking for help. And so what I did is I took this and created a, um, a scavenger hunt to make um, to make the youth go up into our nonfiction section, which is, you know, three floors, it's huge, um, but it's basically sort of a um, secret wayfinding device to help them get used to, to using the collection upstairs. So this slide represents a service that we're doing to incarcerated youth, and um, one of the reasons we spent so much time on the refugee side is because the skills that we learned um, by collaborating at the refugee centers and uh, the toolkit that we created is what I use to really expand my services in other areas. In this picture, you see students that are um, incarcerated. They're at Echo Glen Juvenile Detention Center. And I work with uh, local branch staff in that specific service area to bring programming to these kids. And right now what you see is they are working on some word-based curriculum. And uh, Washington State Library has also partnered with us on this to bring vouchers so these kids can test and try to pass their Microsoft Office certification. But again, the same thing applies. I don't know what skill level I'm going to get with these kids. I don't know where they're at. So when I come in, I do the interview, and I talk to them, and then I, I start my curriculum based on where they're at. In this situation, we ended up getting most of the students to increase their scores by 200 or 300 uh, percent. We did not get anyone to pass. There's a lot of testing anxiety and other things that we have to deal with um, in this specific group. But we were able to bring the service to them, and I'm really excited about about it. Um, other things that we've done in this area that have worked really well is we've brought Makey Makeys, we've done um, uh, digital uh, game design with these kids, as well as job searching and resume. And um, by working and partnering with the local library, it, it just makes a ro more robust service. They get to um, know the local librarians, and then on occasion, a few of the students that have had good behavior have been able to go back to the library and go to a, a program in the branch. Uh, and then same thing applies here with services to older adults. Um, I think what's really important to note here is older adults really want to stay up in the technology world, and they want to keep their brain working and keep going. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes their hands might be an issue and so, um, or uh, their eyesight and those kinds of things. So it's a good idea to create a curriculum that takes in mind that you might have to slow the pace down a lot for, for this group and then you might have to go back and discuss those things that seem really basic to us. What is wireless? I typically spend 15 minutes on explaining wireless and even the plugs, you know, why the plug, the power cord is not the same thing as a data cable. And um, I always have to plan extra time for one-on-one -on -one assistance with this group because at the end of the day, they all have come with specific needs. My son brought me this, and, and I need to figure out how to make it work and those kinds of things. So this group, I would say I, um, I probably offer the same class almost every time when I go to a senior center or a very slightly um, 
shifted curriculum. But what I always do in this situation in, is I do talk to the facility about what they think the needs are to create a curriculum. But more importantly, I interview the group and see where they're at and then just try to target those, um, those ideas. With the toolkit that we created, this makes it easier. I've, I've already come prepared for a few different um, ways to attack the service. So by, so by doing that, I'm able to switch midstream to get this group right where they're at. Um, so I do basics, you know, uh, computer basics, mousing, all of those things. But another really uh, cool thing they like to do is social media. I'll do a Skype with them because they want to learn how to connect to their grandkids, things like that. It's a very fun class. And typically, I'll call my niece or something, and they get to see it work. It's pretty cool. And then another uh, thing that we just implemented this last year was iPads. iPads to the senior center are amazing. Many seniors are getting iPads as gifts, and they have no clue what to do with them. They don't understand the concept of Apple ID. The top picture there, you see I took the iPads to the refugee center, and I, this is the very lowest, lowest, lowest level class. And these two gentlemen specifically, as well as the rest of the group, would not put them down. They thought this was so fun. And they were able to do basic spelling apps. Um, with the, the other senior centers, I'm able to do more advanced curriculum, like digital downloading, navigation. I have done citizenship classes. Um, there's citizenship testing apps that are there with my more advanced students. Uh, and on the bottom picture, that's actually my son volunteering at the senior center to teach them how to edit their photos and share them. And that was really successful as well. Uh, homeless encampments, much like incarcerated youth, this is a very um, uh, interesting site where you have to kind of come in and tread carefully. It took a long time for uh, them to agree to get me to come on a regular basis. They're not used to regular base services. They're used to people just dropping off a donation and walking away. And so this really took me coming and hanging out with them a couple of times before they were like, all right, we'll let you come and, and teach a class for us. And um, teach a class is an interesting word because, or interesting phrase, because I actually don't teach class in this environment. What I do is I come, I bring computers, and I create an open lab that anyone's allowed to come in. And I spend a lot of time working on establishing trust and having open conversation with this group. It's really important that um, the trust is established first before I ever do anything because if I started in with a word class, they would all just turn away. But what I found by just sitting there and being with them and talking with them respectfully and getting to know them, now they feel comfortable coming to me with questions. They don't feel like I'm going to judge them or, um, you know, give them this unnecessary lecture on where they should be in life. They really understand that I'm just there to help. And that's been important. It's always great to bring things. I started bringing books that they requested, and it was like Christmas. One lady wanted, um, we were doing a giveaway of the uh, sticky notes, and I brought a bunch of sticky notes, and they thought that was amazing. They just loved that. So bringing something simple just to know that you remembered them is is great. One of the challenges with um, going to a homeless encampment is that they move every uh, 90 days. So where Summer and I had a, a great thing going, uh, Refugee Women's Alliance is there. She was at that library. So we could create this awesome partnership. With the homeless encampments, that's different. They move every 90 days. And we live in King County, so they can move anywhere. There was uh, one homeless encampment that was at Shoreline Library, which is up north of Seattle. If you're not familiar with the area, about 30 minutes north of Seattle, maybe 20. And they were there. They, they had a host church in Shoreline let them stay. And so they got to spend six months in Shoreline. And so there was a great partnership formed with the Shoreline Library. But then their next move was 
down uh, Martin Luther King Way, which is in South Seattle, which is a good 30-minute drive down. And so what we found there was not only did we have a transition with the local branch staff that needed to quickly familiarize themselves with the site and provide services, we also found that we needed to start over. We needed new transportation packages. We needed new information about what was in their, the services in their area that could actually help them provide for them. And then we had spent all this time creating relationships and rapport with these people, but with that big of a move, we saw a huge um, turnover in residents, so we had a bunch of new residents coming in. And in this particular site, we had a lot of families, and so librarians were able to actually bring um, story time to the tent cities and uh, bring free books to the kids, which was really great. So when doing this, it's really important to have good communication. We created a calendar online on our intranet that everyone could access, and we started keeping notes for the site in the calendar so the person going to the next site knew exactly what had been going on in that service just by looking up the notes on the calendar. And um, it was important that we recognized and set priorities. The priority wasn't going to be that we had 10 people get on board and fill out and complete a word class. But the priority was, was that we were there providing a service and we were able to do job searching. We were able to do um, some reader's advisory or we were able to just create an experience much like visiting a library in the building which people could just have free open access to computers. And that is, um, is probably the most important piece of that service. And then finally, we have an opportunity to work uh, and bring uh, services to teens and tweens, especially the teens are really hard to reach. Uh, we implemented Minecraft uh, a few years ago, and Minecraft, you see the top picture is actually in a branch, but most of this was done in outreach services. We partnered with free lunch programs, uh, community centers, after school programs, um, facilities that targeted at-risk youth. I even went to apartment complexes that had a, a high um, resident rate of refugee students, and we brought the programming to them. Um, in three months, we saw 471 students just doing the Minecraft coding stuff. Uh, I did have Scratch and some more advanced curriculum on board as well for those students, but we were able to um, meet a wide age group with that and have just on-the-fly programs that uh, were, met the kids where they were at. Currently, we are working on, for 2016, a program called Idea X. Idea X is bringing 3D printing, robotics, electronics, gaming, and digital media, just like you see here in, um, and it is bringing them to these same communities as well. And what we're trying to do is just create a bridge between uh, where the kids are at and getting them to understand that they can come into the library and have this fun, amazing experience as well. Uh, with preschool age students, one of the things I work on is uh, Scratch Junior, so giving them coding ideas. They thought this was the best thing ever. They loved it. I used iPads with them. And on the right, you see them doing a little basic catalog search. They needed help with, from their teachers to use the mouse a little bit, but you'd be surprised what three and four-year-olds can do. Um, and on that particular day on the right, we, we looked up uh, Mo Willems' book trailers, and they were able to watch short movies about the books, and then I had books right there ready for them to choose from. Um, so there is uh, programming available for the younger ones to get going. It's just knowing which apps and, and the right way to connect that. I typically do a preschool program for only about 20 minutes before it gets totally out of control. <laughs> So I think you probably have all been asking what resources do I have to make this happen. And I think Summer mentioned that uh, we, we work for King County Library Systems and I'm in the unique position of having a, a great um, array of tools. One of the things I use is the 36 foot Winnebago and I don't know if you noticed in the slide before. Those are the kids in the Winnebago. It's a classroom style setting and that's actually me teaching the class. And then for those facilities that parking isn't available or if you do not have a 36 foot Winnebago in your pocket, you might be able to use something similar to um, 
the toolkit here that we have. This is the to-go kit. It has eight computers in it. This is actually a portable wireless um, uh, hotspot thing. Um, I'm sorry. I'm losing the word <laughs> in my head. Sorry about that. And then I also have a, uh, not, a package of eight iPads that I can use. And um, I just put on here a few of the uh, apps that I use. I use the iPads pretty much in any location, seniors, refugee centers, kids, everything. So what I think is the big takeaway from this is whether you have the opportunity to have a giant Winnebago. What you can do or not. You can use four laptops. You can use two iPads. You can be providing this service um, with minimal resources. What's most important is that you have ready to access curriculum that can be modified. I'm going to just jump in here. I've noticed that lots of folks must need to be on the desk at 10. So um, you, I believe, are you ladies going to be able to stay a little bit past 10 to answer questions? Yeah, okay. we are. Yeah, we're getting really close okay. to the end here, and yes, we can stay a few minutes. So yeah, so so this technology toolkit, I'm just going to actually quickly uh, go through. I believe this will be available in the recorded version, but these are some ideas of activities that we've put together for you that um, you can look at uh, mock cover letters, resumes, um, and if you have questions about different. Um, programs that we've run, uh, we were, both of us would be happy to give you what we do in more detail. But this is our technology toolkit. These are things that we just knew automatically. If someone was here, we'd direct them to scratch. If someone was very advanced, we would start doing a uh, resume builder, potentially. So depending on where they were at, we would just have these resources ready to get them going on the computers. And then so this is just a small list of some of the things that I did with um, the Refugee Women's Alliance student in the library. Um, sometimes we would just have kind of an open lab concept but with books. Like I would bring out um, what we started just calling the country books where um, I would try to get the sort of homeworky books um, for each of the countries of the students that were there that day and just put them all out and people would spend a lot of time talking about um, you know, how things were in their country before they left, um, comparing pictures, and um, it got a lot of really good dialogue going that way. Um, atlases always were a huge hit. And then sometimes we would use a very, very, very easy um, nonfiction, um, you know, the e e-books, e-nonfiction about um, United States or presidents and um, would practice in English literacy that way. Um, bananagrams and Boggle are the best. Um, it's really fun to incorporate the um, English literacy in a, in a game setting. Um, I got a small grant from the King County, um, oh no, from the city of SeaTac actually to purchase a set of um, very easy books that we use for an ESL book club. And I did that with um, several different titles. We would just have the students read out loud and do some um, reading comprehension, talk about what was happening in the book. And again, I got some really interesting dialogue started. Um, recruit your children's librarians. They are great for basic literacy skills. Um, you know, and again, Danielle can I, and I can talk about different ideas all day long. Um, there's lots and lots of different things you can do with the ESL students in particular in your library. So I included this uh, slide, um, not to be bragalicious, but <laughs> more to point out a, a, a change in our service strategy. If you notice that we have been doing these computer classes in an outreach basis since 2006, and our average uh, um, number of participants was about six. And once we started changing our service strategies and making it more adaptable to a wider variety in the audience, we saw a dramatically increased bump in how many people participated. Um, I think the refuge, uh, apart from the refugee center, 
we were before they were only getting probably six or seven to their job classes. Once Summer and I really attacked it in a different level, almost all the students that were there attended. So we were getting 40 to 50 students a day. Um, and that really helped increase the numbers. Same thing when I went to Tent City, originally I'd get two to three people, but by just leaving it low key and letting them come on and feel comfortable and ask questions at their uh, leisure, I was getting 25 people a day after a few months of service. So it really changed um, the way we delivered. By deliver changing the way we delivered service, we saw a major increase in numbers over the course of the actually a really short period of time. Okay, and just a few questions to leave you with um, when you're thinking about doing your outreach. Um, are there meetings um, already in place that you can, I mean, basically meeting crash? Um, in Tecwella, we had a service providers group that would meet on a monthly basis, and it was all the service providers in the area would get together um, and just share services. Um, and by being involved in that discussion every month was very insightful into uh, what was happening, what the service gaps were. Um, figuring out who well serves your community, how can you can start a dialogue um, going with them. And then just where do people gather in your community? Um, are there ways that you can get in on that somehow? Is there an event? Maybe you could table. I mean, I know that's pretty low-hanging fruit, but um, just getting out there as much as you can and building those relationships is going to go a long way into um, a successful outreach program. Um, and then finally, take a really good look at what tools you are going to need to serve that community best. So that kind of wraps up the basics. Um, Danielle and I are available to hang out and answer any questions that people might have. Well, I want to say thank you. And um, if you would like to, if any of you have any questions that you would like to type in or uh, use your headphones or headsets if you wish, uh, you can do that. Um, I just had one question while people are thinking about questions that they may have or give them an opportunity to type in chat. And then I was wondering, uh, both of you, it sounds like um, maybe only one of you had responsibilities inside a branch that pretty much outreach was your primary topic or your primary position. Is that correct? So, right. Um, what happened, I can't remember exactly when this started at KCLS, I think it was around 2008, um, what they did was basically overhaul their entire staffing model um, with the idea that librarians would be freed up from the desk and able to get out into the community and spend a significant amount of their time on outreach. So I think when I first started as a librarian at KCLS, I probably had like 35 hours of desk time. Um, and by the time I left, it was less than 10 every week. Um, so that freed up uh, so much of my time that I was able to get out and do a lot of my work outside of the actual branch. Okay. And then um, to a, you know, and Seattle Public Library is moving towards that. They don't have the staffing model um, quite in place to the level that um, King County does. But um, you know, outside of my desk hours, um, we, the expectation is that I will be really focusing on getting out of the building and working with community partners. Okay. Do you see? Uh, we have a question. Here, right. that says, does anyone do yeah. outreach for convalescent centers? If so, what do you offer? Yeah, I'll speak to both of those. I'm going to answer your first question, and that is that Danielle Duval at KCLS is 100% outreach all the time. And so I know that's unfair for a lot of you, but <laughs> I do, that's my primary job. And then the second question is, um, does anyone do outreach for convalescent centers? If so, what activities do you offer? Um, I do work in assisted living facilities, not necessarily convalescent centers, but people with um, disabilities. And I find that iPads tend to work better um, in those environments uh, depending on hands. I also will bring um, different keyboards or um, mouse 
uh, to those groups as well. Um, in some of my places, I have uh, all wheelchair users or walker users, and typically I would bring a kit into those facilities. And um, and what do I do? It depends um, at a veteran. Uh, place where there's disabled veterans, they actually are really interested in coding, and so we do offer some coding things. If I'm working in um, more of a senior assisted living facility, it might be um, uh, showing them how to read books online, different things like that. But one another thing that went really well in a memory care facility was a story core. We gave them pictures and then we recorded um, and interviewed them based on their family pictures so they had an opportunity to recall things. So those are some of the things that we do there as well as our outreach librarians do homebound book services and um, they do bring library to go, meaning book services to um, assisted living facilities as well. Okay, any other questions or comments? I had one other uh, question. Uh, how, I mean, given the fact that most of us probably don't have the same freedom that you guys do, how often, would, how long is it going to take us to build relationships? Do you recommend trying once a month? Are we taking twice a month? Um, is once a month going to be good enough? Uh, do you need once a week? How often do you need, you know, what's, what sort of the, can you do it by only going out once a month? Well, I would say one of the reasons that, yeah, one of the reasons that um, underneath the refugee center, I, there's, it says high needs in quotes. And how I do that is basically by deciding um, it's an arbitrary delineation between the facilities. But I identify those as high needs, medium needs, and low needs, I guess. And so the high need sites, especially places like the refugee centers, in order to get the skill building, you do need to go more frequently. When um, the service was created, they were going once a month. When I took it over, I went twice a month and when summer joined we ended up going weekly and that was by partnering um, with another librarian. Um, due to limited resources I'm only able to see tent cities once a month, um, the incarcerated youth once a month uh, and then there are some senior centers, uh, homeless shelters, things like that that I might pop in more often depending on what they need. So with the Microsoft Office program at the incarcerated youth, we ended up doing a six-week intensive program. So it really just depends. Um, and it also depends on your goals and outcome. If you're uh, with the seniors, it really is OK to just do once a month. But with that uh, group that we're really trying to skill build and get somewhere else, uh, we did increase it to weekly. Summer, do you want to? Yeah, Summer wants to say something about that. So I'm finding now in my new position um, that I spent the first several months doing a lot of relationship building. Um, and so I went to agencies serving homeless youth pretty frequently. Um, we, and then we also had a weekly drop-in that was happening in the library that was um, co-hosted by an agency that serves homeless youth. Um, and we ended up um, kind of taking a hiatus from that just because numbers were going down and then really focusing on the outreach. And I think once you um, start getting a strong relationship established with the agency staff and then, um, you know, once the the clients start seeing you a lot, once they start to recognize you, like so I've gone to several different agencies and seen the same youth at different agencies, um, and we've heard from the youth that seeing library, seeing the librarians in their space has really made um, a positive impact on how um, how they see the library, it just it shows effort on our part um, that we really wanted to reach those youth and serve those youth. I think once you get the relationship established, like right now I'm going to one agency twice a month and then the other agencies we go once a month about, you know, give or take. Um, but I think once you establish those relationships, it will kind of naturally shake out. Like you can kind of tell how, how frequently you're going to need to go. Okay, um, the, uh, Jeremy has said that the archives will be up by noon today, and um, but well, if not sooner. And if you have any other questions, right now is the time to copy down um, Danielle's and Sumner's, Summers' um, 
contact information, and we very, very, very much appreciate them sharing their experience of uh, successful outreach and partnering. Um, I took lots of notes, so I'm sure many of us did as well. So thank you very much, and uh, I would uh, encourage you to get in touch with them if you have further questions. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us. We really enjoyed it. Oh, I'm glad. You had lots of good stuff to share. Thank you. Thank you for coming, everyone. I hope you join us next month. Um, I just had that up in front of me, and I forgot to look at what it was. It's uh, Food for Thought is our next session on April 5th.